Welcome back to the Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Alan Makhbatov, a Kazakh-based miner. We talk about the state of Kazakhstan mining, including the new tax and licensing regime, and also a quick bit on Russia mining. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ-listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data-dependent stories at theminermag.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Really excited for today's conversation. Alan, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to talk about Kazakh mining and maybe a little bit about Russia mining as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. So before we start, let's go through uh, just like your background and profile for those who don't know about you. It's one of my favorite parts about mining is that everyone comes from like very different industries and they somehow just like get interested in Bitcoin mining. Like we've had energy traders, we've had logistic managers, we've had uh, people in the Ethereum world and Bitcoin world from all over. So just like a, a profile on yourself, and then we'll jump right into the conversation today about mining in these two jurisdictions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I'm Alan, come from Kazakhstan with the half of my life spent in China as a commodity trader. And now I'm full time uh, Bitcoin miner and an owner of a hosting facility in Kazakhstan. Yeah. Awesome. How, how and when did you get into mining? And we talked a second ago, you were in the commodity space. Uh, went to university for that, as I understood it, and you know, now into Bitcoin mining. But tell me a little bit about how that all came about. Into Bitcoin, I'm saying very early. Uh, my sister introduced first time in 12- 2013 when she joined the Bitfinex team. Um, so since then, I was like as a student and spending le- learning engineering in China uh, without any economic background. So of course, I, as everyone else, neglected uh, Bitcoin. And only years later, even though following the price, I started to realize like, uh, but asking primary question, like, what is the money? Why do I have to see uh, my life in 10 years still working and then not even enough to for an apartment, right? So I started asking this primary question and then that's when Bitcoin realization came. So that was around like 2019. And uh, yeah, the mainly was investing into Bitcoin through that COVID dip. And then once this whole life changed, uh, I decided to quit my job, take care of my family. And uh, yeah, that's when I see the rush into the Bitcoin, the exodus out of China. Um, I spent another half a year looking for a site. And that's when I made a call to invest and build a hosting facility. Awesome. So you first began Bitcoin mining, as I understand it, in Russia before Kazakhstan. Tell me about that first intro of mining up in Russia. And this was before the war with Ukraine, as I understand it, right? Absolutely, yeah. That was 2020, uh, 2021. Um, around May, I was started looking into this um, uh, mining activity because I was freshly quit uh, my job. So I was looking like for passive income. I think for many people, that's uh, how they start looking into this. Um, when the prices crashed for ASICs, that was my first purchase of five units S19J Pro, 100 tera cash. I remember exactly the price, 5,500 bucks in Hong Kong, new. Uh, first batch from uh, Bitmain. I moved them to Russia, and then over time, I saw. I mean, at the time, the hash rate uh, dropped significantly and uh, difficulties as well. So I just start accumulating and basically using this uh, uh, snow uh, snowball effect. Yeah, throughout the whole, I guess, up till even now. Yeah. Took only a half a year break during the tough time of last year. Yeah. And then from there, you started operating a hosting facility in Kazakhstan. Tell me a little bit about like finding a location for that and then growing that business. So Kazakhstan is a big country and um, we were looking for abundant energy, secure, in a sense, location. We went through seven locations uh, at the time during the hype uh, when prices were inflated, the land was inflated all around the substations. Um, so at the end, we located on the Almaty region, which is... Uh, the largest uh, population in in the country. It is not a uh, capital, but a financial center. We built a 10 megawatt facility. Uh, the reason why we located this uh, region, even though it's more expensive than the others at the time, is because this uh, financial municipality, uh, or I would say region, was crucial to be always supplied at no matter what, where other regions could be uh, first in line to be cut off. That was 2021 end. So in December, 
31st uh, of 2021, we've uh, commissioned the first container. Okay, so for today's conversation, and again, thank you for that background. We're really digging into some of the new laws and regulation that have come through Kazakhstan recently. I believe a lot of it was passed in early April, but you can correct me in a moment. Uh, and some of these things for listeners who aren't familiar with it, uh, Kazakhstan had a large amount of hash rate, upwards of 20% of the network at one point in time. But since then, it's decreased. A lot of that decrease has been because of the spotty energy uh, in the country. A lot of it's like Soviet era coal, uh, and then also just like old infrastructure that needs to be updated. And Bitcoin miners blossom there because of the cheap energy prices, but then were then subsequently driven out because of regulation and also just uh, energy uh, curtailment, I guess we could call it. Um, so right now it's it's back below its peak by, I'd say about 60% or more, around 400 megawatts operating in the country. Interesting to see both the upward and downward lick happen so quickly. So we'll go through that. And first place probably to start is just like this licensing regime that has moved into the country and talking about that. Um, so if I could hand it off to you to sort of tell me what the lay of the land was before this licensing regime came in, and then we'll move in through the to the four parts of the new licensing. So before the licensing took place in April this year, uh, as a new mining law, the previous system was more simplified, uh, where we only pay one a local tenge per kilowatt hour as a tax for mining, and uh, the, the so-called license was an informative base where we informed the Ministry of Digitalization on our activities, what kind of machines we host, uh, and who are our clients, who is well informed of the mining activity, uh, the ministry. Uh, but now the big change is that the whole licensing process is taking place, not just on miners, but the, on the whole up infrastructure of, of, of this activity, where even the mining pools are required to obtain the license and meet the basic requirements. So, but as I said to my friend, this is whole thing to control the income and monitor uh, our activity. Interesting. And so, so my understanding was like a lot of this licensing moved through because of the energy curtailment in the country. Tell me a little bit about that. Like what was the energy situation, like the prices at the time that you guys were able to pay for hosting or just for like an off-grid miner somewhere? And then what changed over time? What was, what was sort of the reason for uh, the changing? I guess um, my conclusion to this whole story uh, is that uh, we as a miners inflicted uh, the pain ourselves. Um, the price range for electricity, they're ranging from super cheap, let's say, uh, maybe one point something cent per kilowatt up to five, five cents, uh, roughly, range. Uh, the government at some point realized that um, some prices were subsidized or some uh, beneficial relationships were um, used to obtain super cheap electricity. So unfairness as well as mining revealed the weak point in our infrastructure that it hasn't been refurbished, let's say, that way over the decades. We were being the blame uh, for some, at some point. But of course, as uh, illegal miners as well were taking advantage of high revenue, they were built basically growing like mushrooms everywhere. Yeah, and uh, uh, damaging the infrastructure as we know. Yeah. Okay, so what was the like the breakdown for a lot of the, the miners in Kazakhstan? Is a lot of off grid? Is a lot of miners on grid? Are miners plugging directly into uh, power stations? How are most of these miners operating in Kazakhstan? So at the time, mostly in industrial zones where they are uh, at at least ten kV or six kV uh, uh, substation, right? Transformer. Uh, the basic F mining machines cannot be plugged in-house because our basic uh, lining and the electric, electric infrastructure in the houses are so weak that it cannot just hold on the load. Uh, so these are the welding facilities, some warehouses, of course, next to substations, etc. And then within the land of power generating stations as well. Uh, mostly is on grid. Uh, we don't really have uh, off-grid developed. Even if we're talking about gas generation, this is a commercial gas connected to the uh, main pipeline. So that's interesting to note that a lot of it is on grid specifically. Uh, my understanding is like a lot of the mining that happened during like that bull run. Let's we'll go back in time uh, for listeners. We're talking about like late or second half of 2021 after the Chinese uh, Bitcoin mining ban. 
a lot of these companies moved to Kazakhstan because they couldn't operate in China anymore. It was a shorter journey than moving to North America and dealing with like a whole different licensing regime. So they set up shop in Kazakhstan and then they quickly overburdened the grid. Do you think that's like historically pretty accurate or do you think it was more of just like a homegrown event where a lot of Kazakh miners were growing uh, and, and importing a lot of machines? Um, there were several miners before the boom uh, since 2018. And they were growing steadily and weren't attracting too much uh, uh, attraction. But with the Chinese inflow and such a demand, uh, local businessmen, entrepreneurs start offering sometimes unrealistic promises uh, and locations at a high value. Uh, there are so many projects that haven't, haven't been even started or finished. Uh, so I would say a lot of Chinese people with their hunger as well drove this craziness in the market. So there were so many mm, locations built through uh, uh, unwise, let's say, in the long term, uh, within the special industrial zone, where they're trying to u- utilize the beneficial uh, economic terms, or in the greenhouses where they have actually lower electricity, which is not uh, covering the mining uh, activity. So they you take basically take advantage of those power rates, or next to the largest uh, power generating company in, in, in the north, within that land, at super cheap prices, right? While the government during these um, infrastructure issues or the outages due to, you know, breakages of the power generation, they had to import from Russia and pay uh, three times higher price. So basically the government was out of their pocket subsidizing some of the largest miners. So that drove the anger uh, and the wrath of our government. Yeah, uh, speaking about the emotion there, do you think there was a lot of like frustration on the government side, or was there? Did it even seep into like the general population, knowing that there was blackouts and rolling brownouts and stuff like that in Kazakhstan because there was just like an overtaxed power grid? There was just an at- at- attack to put the blame during the outages on miners. So during the news, there was like a, just like what happened we saw with the attack on banks and crypto in general this year. So that's the same happening in the local uh, new media where public started to become frustrated and start blaming us. This, of course, uh, only lasted for a few months and then until the campaign was over, but then the damage has been done. Uh, so just to give you an example, during those years, we had 265 plus minus few uh, registered mining companies in Kazakhstan based on the official list uh, of Ministry of Digitalization. Uh, and Q1 of this year, the quarterly report that we all have to submit, there's only 51 companies. So exactly 80% reduction in the mining activity. So we can even compare from this point where uh, total hash rate, what we have now, is also roughly around 80% reduction. And what's coming next in in terms of mining law uh, is even skinnier. I think the rest of 20% might die as well. Wow, so it might not have a cause like mining industry in a, a short bit is that what you're thinking uh if they don't have a pivot in terms of taxation there is a big changes right be- beyond the licensing so uh from july 1st we starting to do the national power auction training system where uh, miners only allowed to purchase electricity through that auction where uh national grid on a real-time basis will determine whether the grid has excess energy or shortage of it, um, we be able to trade some sessions on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly uh, basis. But right now, it's going through simulation as we speak a few days ago as well. But the indications are not very um, bright, uh, I would say very uh, gloomy, because even in those sessions, they has a minimum starting price that is uh, offered by the power generating companies. Uh, and as we do the calculations, our cost of production, based on just this simulation, even though it's uh, not real, uh, indicates that our cost could be as low as 7.1 cent starting from July if we do participate. Uh, so I hope that this is just an example and the real prices would just come to the what we're we paying now. I mean, as you know, with the mining tax that is implemented this year, uh, it's not just now uh, one tenge per kilowatt hour, which is like, 0.2 cents. Now it is, if the cheaper you have electricity, the higher taxes. So based on our uh, optimum number, the ideal uh, price you can get, so 
electricity price plus the mining tax is 5.55 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's the lowest you can get. Which is not great when you're looking at some of these North American miners who are you know, operating at 2.3 to all the way up to like 3.5 cents, depending on like their deals. Let's go through like the four points of this uh, new regulation that has rolled in. So first, licensing. My understanding is that you have to register with the national government, especially for tax purposes. Second, you have to use a state-owned exchange or pool in order to mine and sell your Bitcoin that's being rolled in gradually. So to start, you only have to sell like 25% of your Bitcoin at a state-owned exchange, and then over time, it's going to move towards 100%. There's also this minimum tax on top of Bitcoin mining. So those are the three parts. I think I said four earlier, but I think there's three parts to this. Tell me about that a little bit more in depth, starting with the licensing. Did a lot of these miners license like back in 2017, 2018, or is this truly like a new licensing regulation that started only the last month? So it's been truly a new a new licensing process. The list and the requirements are very broad. Uh, so the, let's say KYC is quite deep, but it's also a solution to the problem that happened a few years back where a lot of machines were imported not through white customs, but gray or black customs, you know, as they put the machines with the shoes, uh, with the bags together crossing the border. So during that crackdown, a lot of like um, uh, gray custom machines were confiscated. Some were left behind. Uh, and in order to legalize those machines as well, where uh, miners can register a serial number uh, with uh, the uh, government and get this license. So, so to speak, that they belong to you uh, and you can operate them. And every time you change the location, you have to notify the government. Uh, so there's that. In terms of mining tax, yes, uh, they build a range. So the minimum is one tinge. As I said, it's at 2.2, 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour. And the lower electricity, the higher it goes. Yeah. So effectively, there's a floor of 5.5 cents uh, for nationwide uh, mining activity. Yeah, which really makes it cost prohibitive. Uh, speaking about the pool and exchange part, that really caught my eye because it's interesting. I think the purpose here is like sort of nationalistic, right? Where they want to keep any sort of economic activity or economic growth within Kazakhstan. And so they're trying to move all of the flows of money through these national entities of the pools and the exchanges. My concern with both of this is that the exchange, you might not get a good price and then for the pools, you might not have enough luck in a smaller pool and that could hurt your growth. How stringent do you think they're going to be on top of these things? Are they going to allow just like white labeling? I know some one thing like Binance still operates in the region. So maybe Binance will be like licensed by the Kazakh government to be able to uh, be used by these miners. But any thoughts on that? Um, so just a few uh, things on the exchanges and the selling. So this rule will apply in next year where 50% uh, of the mined Bitcoin must be in case you want to sell it yeah, to cover your costs through that exchange. It's not uh, state-owned uh, from the commercial bank, actually. There are five licensed uh, crypto exchanges. There are only few who have a website and actually operational. Uh, and from 2025, you must at least sell 75% of Bitcoin. In terms of liquidity, uh, I do have big concerns. Uh, but we we yet to see uh, how it's really going to develop. The reporting as well is very very individualized for them. Uh, so information from my worker, the hash rate, uh, daily revenue, is all will be uh, uh, reported on a monthly or quarterly basis to the government. Because we they also going to apply the corporate income tax at some point on this. Uh, but this is the least of my concerns. Concern is that. Um, with this whole initiative where the, even the pools required to have two servers in the country, uh, they have to submit uh, all the information on the customers. The industry is suffocating. For the machines imported in the country, you pay 12% VAT. Then electricity includes VAT 12%, which is not subsidized or doesn't really strike off because it's actually export of energy. Uh, further, you have other taxes because as a corporate entity, you operate in, in, in the country. Now, with these energy prices rising, another big uh, headwind is that 
local currency is very strong, outperforming many other currencies against the dollar. One of the reasons because, yes, we are the export energy uh, country, but then due to the war, the demand for the local currency from the rubble side, from Russia, is so strong that um, our prices in dollar terms have risen significantly. While you look at that neighbor country, Russia, uh, where that was a situation a year ago, completely upside with uh, Kazakhstan. I even paid eight cents dollar uh, last year in June due to the very, very strong ruble. Now it's on the opposite. I pay five cents in Russia just because the ruble is very weak and while Tenge here is so strong. That's interesting how the currency controls go into this. So yeah, let's, let's turn towards that, uh, the Russia side of this. I know that you also operate some uh, mines in Russia. What is it like to be a Russia miner? What's it like before the war and now as the war has progressed? There was lots of mining companies being built, uh, lots of as well as scammers. So it was quite a um, torturous process. Uh, but I was lucky enough to partner with some uh, Ukrainian company, my rig. Um, the um, operating since, I don't know, 20, even 17, uh, quite early. They built a f- large and very advanced mining facility in Krasnoyarsk region. So where I'm hosting my machines with them. I'm very quite satisfied. But the the path was, as I said before the war, the private prices were stable, but the ruble was um, at, with the range of 75, 80 to dollar. And uh, growing quite rapidly, very advantageous because the excess energy is really abundant there. Uh, I was talking about gigawatt. Uh, and now after the war, uh, this whole turbulence, um, now more and more people investing into mining because the government actually supporting in many directions they also prevent centralization of uh, decision making uh, for mining. Where, for example, you remember a year ago, uh, Central Bank wanted to have a licensing process and the Ministry of Finance were against it. This is a uh, opposite picture of what happens in Kazakhstan. So um, I'm, I'm really liking the prospects in Russia. Even the local business entrepreneurs now looking to gas because it's really become very abundant in the in, in the region. Gotcha. Tell me a little bit about like importation of ASICs into Russia, uh, importing equi- equipment and infrastructure, purchasing it there. Is it more difficult now because of wartime measures? Uh, is it just, or even like the strengthening or weakening of the currency, as you mentioned? After as well? the war, after the war, uh, Russian Federation, they uh, initiate a ban on key uh, materials. And luckily, not luckily, I'm sorry, surprisingly enough, ASICs were part of the ban. So ASICs couldn't leave the country. They were part of the key equipment uh, in that list. You could import it easily, but not export it. In terms of current situation, uh, the machines are flowing in. I've spoken to many ASIC suppliers uh, in China and Shenzhen. Uh, Last year, the main market was Russia. Now Dubai and the Emirates, I mean, uh, they're growing, but Ra- Russia remained quite strong. The farms are being built, especially in its uh, east region. The VAT of 20% that is in Russia applied, they're actually very tolerable for ASICs. So basically, it's a great custom, but then the government doesn't hunt them. It's like There's no winch hunt for a great custom machines. As long as they are plugged in and mining, and the electricity that they pay is already including the 20% VAT on that energy bill. Uh, I mean what else you can wish for, right? So Yeah. What what are some of the energy costs you're seeing and how easy it is how easy is it to find energy within Russia? Um I'm not so sure how to find the energy in terms of already uh as a potential project to build, but in is existing of hosting facilities are plenty. Uh the service is quite mature where uh they are I can change my settings myself in the remote without reliance on the hosting facility. Um, there's apps. So the price range, of course, goes from 3.5 rubles to all the way uh, to 4.5 rubles. To give you that as a perspective, 3.5 divided by 84, that's the exchange, is 4.2 cents US dollar up to 5.4 cents US dollar. Gotcha. This is the high end of the range. But this happens because as it's past few days, the ruble depreciated further. Gotcha. And that's for hosting, right? Not just for all in self mining. And that's just the hosting. Yeah. So yeah, you can imagine the actual cost of electricity is lower. But then um, 
as always happened with maturity of this business, the mining, no, the hosting margins as well squeezed. They're no longer fat uh, earnings per kilowatt hour. Where hosting facility in order to survive understands that it's a two-way road. So their margins are squeezed. So as our facility in Kazakhstan as well, to make sure that miners stay profitable at our facility throughout the difficult times. Interesting. So just some side questions around this. Um, I'm curious about when you're typically interacting with uh, your hosting provider in Russia or maybe in Kazakhstan, what kind of currencies are you guys paying with? And are you guys using any cryptocurrencies to pay for it, like Tether? Yes, uh, there's options to pay in Tether and then Bitcoin. We as well can receive payments in this and convert through the exchange into the local currency, which is now is doable. But we prefer uh, to pay in local currency and convert ourselves where we control the exchange rate and the timing when we do that. Um, it often happens that mm, if you use the uh, their um, invoice in US dollars, the exchange is not always the, the beneficial to me. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Well, as we start to wrap up the conversation here, I'm curious on your thoughts on like where this market is going. You mentioned earlier that Kazakhstan mining might just dry up because of this new tax implementation, bringing a minimum forward of five cents. Uh, and then in Russia, it seems like it's still doing quite well, able to import ASICs, cheap energy, pretty mature market. Are you expecting that Kazakhstan will continue just to give up its ASICs? And where do you think those ASICs will flow? And then for Russia, where do you see the future of hash rate? So for Kazakhstan, um, after the Chinese ban and an inflow of very effective machines, whoever could have left to Russia migrated to America. What have left behind um, is very ineffective machines who has no place right now in the market. So they're just sitting somewhere idle. This market in terms of Kazakhstan, uh, as long as the prices for electricity don't go lower, uh, or stop increasing, uh, this industry become very unprofitable and only a handful of self miner with efficient machines may, may hold up. But then I forgot to mention this simulation trading that we were a few days ago. It looks like the available quota per day, uh, and the throughput at the time it, it showed there's like seven or nine hours per 24 hours. We allowed to use the energy. This is what simulation showed me so far. So if that really happens now, that the prices are rising by 30% from what I pay now, uh, but also limited to nine hours, this is a catastrophe. Basically. Really quick before we get to the Russia side, what do you think firms like Canaan or other large miners in the area who invested a lot will do because of the licensing? Uh, with the Canaan uh, specifically, I don't think because they are in the West. Uh, we they operate on the commercial gas, so have no interruptions and no uh, effect from the grid. Uh, their other facility in the north uh, is consuming already imported energy from Russia, um, and they operate only twelve hours per week, uh, per per week working days, and twenty four hour basis on weekends. But their cost as well are close to seven cents. So you can imagine like how how their business is doing as well in Kazakhstan. Yeah. Okay, so pretty tight. Uh, let's go to Russia then before we close out here. What are you expecting for the growth of Russian hash rate? And before the China ban, it was around 10%. I think it's a little bit higher now. I don't have that number in front of me. Uh, but recently, a lot of people have made some cries about it online that Russia is you know, adding hash rate to the network. Do you think that's going to increase? Do you think it's going to become another sizable minority? Yeah, I continue to see that them continuing growing. First of all, they have this uh, abundant energy resource. Um, their currency right now is uh, giving them uh, more reason to mine as even the in, in ruble terms, the energy has risen, but in dollar terms, it has fallen, which is yeah, makes them quite very competitive, even after the halving. You know. uh, just a um, few thoughts on our strategy to survive this uh, halving. As, yeah, as a money facility connected to the grid, of course, the halving... Uh, poses a big threat. Uh, so we're looking into the associated gas, I mean, flare gas in the, in the west of Kazakhstan. It's like a Texas uh, in, uh, of Kazakhstan. And um, this is the strategy that we're looking to, yeah, to raise funds and build on associated gas. Gotcha. Do you want to go through that for a second? What's the, maybe like a, a layout of the grid 
or energy zones in Kazakhstan would be interesting because my knowledge is like the south is predominantly grid and then there's like the north and west have different parts. But can you give us uh, a, a feeling for that? Pretty much there's four regions, yes. And then they're all connected to the grid. But we are referring to um, some of the locations in the west where the oil fields are far from the grid, uh, also from the main gas pipelines. These are the locations that are ideal because with this new mining tax law, we fall under the item five. Item five is says the power generation without reliance on the grid, uh, with self-invested funds, uh, can do whatever they want and use the energy for whatever they want. Uh, the only thing is that there is some loophole in the in the law that for self-generation, you pay ten tenge uh, mining tax. Uh, and if you generate through solar and wind, then it's back to one thing get tax. Uh, so associated gas, which category does it fall to? Uh, this is a question here. Gotcha. Interesting. So if you're going to guess, you'd say that more Bitcoin mining is going to start up in the West and we'll have like a, a better system for mining out there. I hope so. There's so many benefits for the oil fields, but with their, um, with their narrow mindset, I'm afraid that uh, oil industry is not going to uh, take this opportunity and develop it further. That's an interesting note. Awesome. Yeah. Any, anything else you want to touch on before we close out? Well, that's uh, that's it. And my prediction, I guess, um, something we're going to see end of October where the price might start showing li- uh, indications of life. I hope so as well. Let's hope that Bitcoin price goes up. Alan, thank you again for your time. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, Will, for your opportunity and uh, hope to see you again.